Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have another great guest. This guy has been a friend of mine for like, I don't know, two years maybe? Has it been that long? Two years? I have, I have no idea. I don't know. It I feel like it was born yesterday. I feel like, I know, I feel like it's been two years. It could be shorter or longer than that. We met on uh, social media, um, reached out to him about uh, some, some financial products that I offer. And he's like, yeah, hook me up. Let's get it done. So I helped him. But after that, after I helped him as a, as a client, uh, honestly, I got to know a little bit more about what he does, how he helps his clients. And then I started seeing, uh, when I first met him, he was more in a sales position ish. He can, he can correct me if I'm wrong at any of this, but that's what I believe he was doing primarily. Yeah. Um, but then over the last few months, he started having his, his clients post some of the the transformations they're receiving and ever since i met him i liked his personality i liked the way he uh, interacts with the world like the way he talks i remember i don't know i still think about this a lot one one call i was on uh with him i had said something maybe not so nice about the the company we were working with like hey got to get their act in order <laughs> basically because they were getting things screwed up and he said hey it's all good just let's just talk nice about it. I was like, Oh man, good. I'm glad that he was there to remind me, you know, <laughs> to stay positive. Sometimes like it's so easy to get stuck in the weeds sometimes. And he was there just like, you know, it's just who he is, his energy and, and his view on life. So powerful. And then seeing some of his clients results, uh, about being able to change their mindset and change, uh, get health back, get m- mobility back, get freedom back in their life by just changing the way that they think. I called him and I was like, look, I need, I want you to come speak at some masterminds with me. I want you to attend. Uh, and I want you to be on the podcast so we can share this type of information with more people. So John Schutte is his name. He was out in Florida. I'm trying to convince him to live in Arizona, but right now he's <laughs> <laughs> bunking up in Utah, which is good. Utah. Yeah. Is good. Um, but yeah, cool. So th- thanks, John, for showing up. We were talking off air about how he gets around up here. So he's just about to launch into the story of what happened yeah. to his car in New Mexico. And this would be a good introduction to who he is and how he thinks. Yeah, this will be interesting. Um, so because I, um, one thing that I do that almost every person I've ever talked to tells me not to do is like, like share sh- like shit that goes wrong in your life with your own clients. Um, but the reason why I do is because normally people freak out and I don't, uh, that's just like, kind of like the whole, uh, insurance thing. Like I was like, Hey Sam, sell me insurance. He's like, okay, I guess I'll just sell you some insurance. <laughs> um, and, uh, whenever I was driving up here, so I, um, I got let go from a sales position I had, um, on like we sold mindset and um since being on that team i've done like four thousand hours plus uh, mental work and i decided uh like i have a mentor that i'm going to see and we're doing a road trip instead of like flying the first week um well because it's more fun honestly one of the things that um little teeny tiny tidbit um i could drive 10 hours without stopping i've never been able to do that in my life like I, I would always fall asleep after like two or three hours. And I used to travel for work. Whenever I sold tools in people's homes, I'd like go in and I'd have to travel. And um, that's like a teeny tiny win um, that I'll, I'll share here. But uh, what happened was we, uh, we went from Florida to uh, um, so Sarasota. We drove to New Orleans, stayed there for two or three days, hung out with some, uh, some hot European chicks, and, and it was like the first week of Mardi Gras, so like it was pretty fun. 
I, I went to bed early. I didn't go out for Mardi Gras. Sure but, you um, did. Sure you did, John. I, I wanted I wanted to go out so mm-hmm. bad, but my my shoes were completely wet and I had no clean socks. So I would have had to like walk around the city in barefoot. I'm not walking around New Orleans barefoot. Yeah, it's a, a spectacle to see, but um, I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I uh, we're driving from um, we go there for three days. We stay in Houston for a month. Don't go to Houston. It's just not. It's not worth it. It's like it's it's corporate and ghetto, and that's it. There's nothing fun. There's like no cigar bars. Like I don't want to network it with anybody. That it's just not. It's not an exciting place to be. <laughs> um, so I leave Houston, um, and we're driving through all of Texas, which I've done once before. Okay, so check this out. This is the cool thing. This is the life. longest state to get through ever. Yes, it's like 16 hours. And you're still in the same place. And you're just like, you're still in in Texas. (laughs) (laughs) I, um, okay, so backstory. I'm going to do this Pulp Fiction style. So, um, we we already talked about like car breaking down in New Mexico. But three years ago, the way that the mind works is you will keep replaying and recreating the things that are in your mind if you don't clear them out. While the work that I do is like, okay. Like a lot of stuff I'm working on right now is around guilt because like I feel guilty for making so much money so easily. Like I start making all this money and then you have this guilt and then you feel bad for it. So then you sabotage yourself. So I'm like clearing that out right now so I can make money easier because money is so unbelievably easy to make. It's like stupid. Mm-hmm. Like my, it just fall, it literally falls. From, it's made up first of all. So like you can make as much of it as you want. It's just numbers on a screen or like dollar bills that represent nothing other than time and effort. And um, that's why it's like so interesting, like the whole like infinite banking and all that. Like you just like you know, just, money is just debt, so you just create more money by having more debt. Um, but I um, going back, I three years ago was driving through. This is to the whole like you will keep recreating the same thing if you don't clear it out. Um, I was driving through New Mexico. Uh, you remember that storm that hit Texas that knocked out like all their power it was on the news? Like, like, like the winter storm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where like they had never been hit so hard and for some reason like they couldn't get their power back on. So I was driving through that in a front wheel drive 2013 Hyundai Sonata. So that's my car. Not a super exciting car. Um, and I'm driving through that storm. The ice is like this thick on the road and I'm going 70. I actually crashed three times during that road trip. But the most significant one, I was driving, it was like 1 a.m. This is three years ago, right? So I, I spin off of the, the road, and then my car is flying backwards, seven, 70 miles an hour off the road, into the ditch, and I like take out a tree with the back of my car. You can I can show you where my bumper is still missing, because I've been working for the past three years. I haven't even gone fix my car yet. Um, and... I spin out, and I take out a tree, and I'm stuck in the snow, and I try rescuing me, there's a semi that stops, and I'm like, nah, I'm just gonna sleep in my car and turn on the heat every 30 minutes to an hour, and you know, do the survival thing, because like, I'm, I'm big into survival and that kind of stuff. And then a guy stops by, and he picks me up, he's in a truck, and uh, he's like, just come with me, there's a town nearby, and it's Santa Rosa, New Mexico. And uh, you know, you can, I'll help you get a hotel, and then you can call and you know, figure this out tomorrow, I'll try. Uh, I get in this car, he's got like a shotgun, in the passenger seat, like I guess, I get like I kind of like this, but I kind of don't. <laughs> like, I don't like being in my situation right now. Um, and I go and I stay in Santa Rosa for a day. I get my car towed, and um, you know, they it, it was fine. It could run. Fast forward to three and a half weeks ago. Two and a half weeks ago. Wow. Yeah, time's flying by. Um, this was like on the 3rd of March. So very recent. Today's the 20th. And I, uh, we're driving through, and we're going through New Mexico, same exact highway, and my car engine blows up 20 minutes outside of Santa Rosa, New Mexico. I recreated the exact same thing because it was on my mind the whole time. And you get what you focus on. It's not, it's yeah. not, it's not, uh, it's not, um, you get what you focus on uh, 
like if it's just money no you get absolutely everything you focus on because you're creating in your mind and that's all the physical universe is is just manifestations of what it was ever in our mind that's it so i i, I create my iron engine blowing up um like i'm smoking 1 a.m my engine starts pouring into my cabin with smoke and my uh my sunroof is open still and it won't close because the car is dead and uh, i gotta put i had my pillow because i had all all my belongings in my car i'm like moving to la right so uh i put my pillow up on there because that's the only thing that's gonna fit and cover and i'm just like cool i'm just gonna chill out here call up my friend who i travel with he's actually inside right now recording videos for his program and um i'm like hey dude uh my car just blew up can you come get me? And he turns around, comes and gets me. Um, that's the story I was going to share with you because you had asked. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, but the, the reason why um, I think it's interesting is because in the moment, whenever I, uh, I my car blew up and it, it's like, and like the transmission's done, the engine's done, the engine's still like shot. It's just Audi 5000. It ain't working on me. And I, di I, I didn't care. I was just like, I had like a couple, you know, like a little bit of fear. Like, is this where I die? I'm like, okay, cool. Like, that, that's it. And then I'm just like sitting there, you know, for the next hour waiting for my friend, just, you know, in the cold car. Cause I can't turn on my AC or anything. It's like, it's dead. Um, I'm just chilling. I'm like, this is really interesting. I felt more guilty than anything. Guilty for putting him in a tough spot. But I wasn't scared. It's like, that's one of the things is when you do a lot of mental work, you don't fear death. Because you realize, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, well, that's one of the biggest motivators for people is death. And, um, taxes. I'm just kidding. Bigger, <laughs> it's like a bigger motivator than, uh, than, like, having kids and having a good life. They're more scared of death. And the consequences of that, which there are none, than they are of, uh, like, more people are focused on that, on the fear of death, on, on their own goals. Or, like, on the present moment. Like, not many times in our life do we get to experience, like, we live a mundane life, and we're like, man, I want my life to be exciting, but whenever our car blows up in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the night, and there's literally no lights around, you could only see the sky, and it's like gorgeous, it's amazing. We ask for variety in our life, and then we get mad when it happens. That is variety. I asked for that. Yeah. You know, I wanted something interesting to happen, and I got something interesting to happen. Now you have uh, a story. Yeah, those... Yeah, but, um, and then I came back here and, uh, closed because I started my business on January 1st, closed my first $10,000 deal in my business and, uh, with a coaching client who's like, it's insane. He's been like, text, he's got text waiting for me right now to read. He's like constantly sending me wins. So, like, to go from that, most people will get knocked off the horse. The reason why I share this is because, like, for everybody who's listening, it is possible to have nothing bother you period it is it, it's like it's it's a that's why i do what i do is like it's like a gift i can get like to have nothing matter because if nothing matters because like things are only tough in life because of the meaning we give the things that we think are important I would, makes, say, I would say nothing matters but everything's significant well that's exactly why things are hard yeah the significance yeah. means that you're adding mental weight to it and or positive, or positive weight to it. So like what, what I'm saying yeah. is for my life, how I would describe like nothing mattering and living just at a homeostasis of happiness or joy is like nothing matters in. So when, when I, generally when the word matters comes up, I feel like it's often a negative connotation. Like it matters that this happens. If this holds a weight of significance or a weight that something changed, where I would say, um, although it's not negative, like it doesn't matter whether it happened or not, it's significant that it did because now I get to choose the reactions out of it. So there was still a turning point when the thing that didn't matter happened or, or there was still an experience to have. So it's like, I would say that was a significant event. There was a lot of events that happened on your trip 
that you're not telling me about. I mean, like probably 34 hours worth of driving that just didn't happen. You know, it, did it all matter? Not really, <laughs> but, and nothing was significant, but the significant was, okay, this happened. Now, what was the significance of that experience? Right. The, the, what did it signify? What did it foretell or, or what was that experience like? So for me, I would say living a life for me as nothing matters as in I'm not placing blame or shame or guilt towards anything. Nothing matters pr- from that perspective, whatever happens happened already and, or is going to happen. But what's the significance this, what does it signify or what does it signal for me in my life? So significance for me, I guess, is a, 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 a variation of the word signal. So what does that experience signal for you in your life? What's the flag? Well, shoot, I created this. Did I mean to create this? Interesting. You know, it's not, it's not good or bad. It's just like fascinating. You know, that's, that's an interesting way. Because a funny story about a car, um, and then I'll let you finish your statement. I promise, John. Oh, no, I, I don't. I want to get this because it's so funny. So um, about three, I don't know, shoot, 2017-ish, I was driving in Orem, Utah. And my buddy had just gotten this new Honda Civic, uh, the STI, whatever, like the performance racing. Yeah. Room. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I like it. But uh, my wife doesn't drive stick. And so I really just want like, I want the same body of, it, of this car, but I want it to be a, like a sedan automatic. But mm-hmm. I still had my old Honda uh, Civic from uh, 2005 Honda Civic that ran just fine. Everything was wonderful with it. Nothing wrong with it, running great. And I'd had it for, I don't know, a number of years. And, but I was thinking all the time about this other car. It's like, man, I want a new car. I want a new car, but this one's good enough. You know, like I want that, but I'm, I have what I have already and I don't need it. In my mind, I didn't need it. Well, I'm driving down the road and I see a police officer in Utah, if you haven't learned this, I don't know if they pull people over in, uh, in Florida a lot, but in Utah, they, it's like their national holiday or, or just like pastime police officers just pulling people over and giving them tickets. They love it. Uh, and there's way too many police per capita in this state. Uh, anyways, so, so I, I'm speeding cause I speed often and I'm like, Oh crap. So I'm looking in my, the whole, the whole thing is just so ironic. So I'm looking in my rear view mirror to see if the police officer is going to pull out after me. And while I'm focused on my mm-hmm. tiny rear view mirror, I end up rear ending this Toyota Tacoma with a trailer hitch on it. It doesn't damaged their car at all, but it totaled my car. Like did not, yeah. did not change their car at all, <laughs> but totaled my car. I still drove away and drove it home. But what's funny is after we got out, made sure everybody was safe and I start driving home. By the way, the police turned to the other direction. So it's like all the things were up yeah. making. That's just so funny about it. Yeah. So I, I get on the phone with, with my wife and I'm like, babe, we're going to get a new car. <laughs> so excited. She's like, what do you mean? Why are we getting a new car? I'm like, because I just totaled this one. This car's done. <laughs> How are you so happy about this? Are you okay? Like, she's asking all these questions. I'm like, I've been waiting for a new car. I could have been more specific about how I wanted to get a new car. I wasn't. <laughs> that was my yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. That was something I could have controlled that I failed to. But I, I'm excited about the new car. I didn't view the experience as a negative in my life. Like, so many people would have been like, oh, my day's ruined, you know? But for me, I was like, I've been asking for this new car. I'm so excited about the new car. <laughs> this was the the uh, the method that the universe chose to progress the storyline simply because I wasn't more clear about how I wanted the storyline to play out. Okay, whatever, you know, and I moved on. So it's just funny. Like, was it, did it matter? No, but was it a significant event? Sure, it was significant in that it signaled my brand to be grateful immediately and be happy and not be, bent out of shape about it, but just like, oh, interesting. Okay. Mm. Moving on. Yeah. So good that's car. How, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Man. That's, that's a good lesson. Like being, yeah. uh, being clear. And inten- you can't be intentional if you are clear on what you want. So mm-hmm. you're asking for a new car, you're going to get a car right. Cause that's what happened to me. I, I kept talking like, cause I give presentations in my business and I talk about my car. But I'm like hyper clear on my car and like what I want it to be and all the details, how I'm going to finance it, all of it. I know every single detail about it. Um, 
and I use it as like a uh, juxtaposition to how most people are clear in their entire life. Most people don't have that level of clarity in anything. Right. Less than in life. But like I know every detail. And I can rattle them off from memory. I can know all the numbers, not not to like, you know, maybe the closest hundred, let's say. I know all the numbers. But um, like I know all of it. Um, and then I pull in my car getting wrecked. And I might be able to total it out, which would allow me to have a down payment to get the car that I So it's not that bad. You know, like, <laughs> and I'm going from a Hyundai to a Jaguar. So it's like, I'm going to be pretty happy with that. And I can drive faster, faster. Because it's, uh, it's a V8 instead of a... What, what Jaguar are you getting? <laughs> what do you should ask? <laughs> is, it, is it the F-Type? <laughs> Uh, no, it's the one that came before the F-Type. I think the F-Type's too, uh, well, actually, by definition, it is. Like, the F-Type was supposed to be the feminine version of the XKR, or the XK, um, because it's smaller, and it's shorter, and it's kind of like a Porsche and a Porsche. Um, so, it's a Jack 2015 Jaguar XKR, black on black, racing seats, with, uh, white stitching. If you look that up, it's, it's a pretty sick car. For, for the price, it's only like 30, it's 34,000. 2015? Uh, under, yeah, under, under, under 40,000 miles. And it's, um, another one that I was looking at. It doesn't exist anymore because it's super rare to have white stitching, but I really want white stitching on racing seats. Um, and it's got a five liter V8 supercharged engine and it, uh, it's as loud as a 2013 Ferrari California, which to put it into perspective is very loud. So, um, that's, that's why actually why the two things I wanted in my car was I want a lot of horsepower for the money, 500 something horsepower for 34 grand, ain't too bad. And then, um, I want it to be, I want people to know I'm there. I want to have the like disgustingly loud, uh, you know, supercar engine. Well, as long as it like goes fast, the problem and sometimes in Utah, probably everywhere, but I see it more in Utah than I do in Arizona now that I moved down there. But you have like these uh, Honda Civics or whatever that are all tricked out and they've got these giant mufflers and it's like, ah! but yeah, it's like dragging. It's not even going fast. It's like, dude, you got no business having that loud of a car that's snail moving down the road. Like, get on. I mean, this is stop. It's stock and super loud, so it's no, nothing fancy. I'll, I don't think it, unless they have a, a part that would make the muffler sound like an actual Jaguar, I would totally buy that. I would love it. Yeah, that'd be but so good. Other than that, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna trick it out because it's uh, it it comes pretty nice. It, 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 whenever it was first sold in 2013, it was a hundred twenty thousand dollar car, so it's got like all of the really nice features, but I don't have to uh, pay a hundred twenty grand for it. Yeah, that sticker price is real crazy. I like the. Yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't done research into the XK, XKR, but I do like the F type a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the XKR I, has a bigger, bigger engine than a uh, a stock F type. But they're very similar, and they look similar, or just. Well, look it up. Look up a X. I'm a looking Jaguar at it. XKR. Yeah. Uh, so an F, F type has, I think it has a, it has the exact same everything. It's just a little bit different body style. It's the same body styling as a, um, Aston Martin, uh, yeah. DBS. It's the exact same body style. So I was like, how can I get really close to an Aston Martin without, you know, spending all that I just, extra I money? fell in love with Jaguars when I was on my LDS mission in Scotland. One of the people there had one and they're just like in my opinion for for a sports type car they're so much smoother to drive in than a lot of sports cars mm. <clears throat> like driving in a mclaren and uh yeah that i think it was a mclaren you're, it's so bumpy and a lamborghini like they're not have you ever done an audi r8 i haven't ever been in an audi r8 oh it's so it's so nice like yeah. the handling, it feels like I'm gliding. Like, imagine you didn't wake up. You're still, your head's still on the pillow. You hear the roar of the engine, but like the suspension's beautiful. So like, you don't feel anything on the road. 
and you just feel like one of the car and you're just gliding through space. It was like one of the best driving experiences ever. I can imagine that because I mean, like, I've never been in an Audi R8, but my friend who has like an Audi Q5, like Mm -hmm. that sucker, I I was shocked when I was in it. I was like, she she was driving way faster than I would have felt comfortable driving on some of the turns, but it handled Mm -hmm. well. Like it was like it just like hugged the curves like nothing. I was like, this is insane that. If I was in my car, I'd, I would have to hit the brakes. I'd have to slow down through this. But in this, it doesn't even feel like you're on a cur- turn. It's just like, mm. I'm going super fast. Is this a, I'm looking up a, oh, okay. So she had, a, yeah, a SUV and she was going fast. Yeah. Okay. We were going like, you know, 90, 100 on a straightaway with this. But I, I pulled like a complete U-turn, like starting speed at 70 miles an hour. And it just, nothing. It's perfect. You're like it was so smooth. That's crazy. And it's got a, uh, it's, I think it's got a V10. It's the same yeah. engine that they used to put in Ferraris before they did the silly little turn every car into an electric car and have no room for them anymore. Um, so <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it's it, it's loud. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But yeah, that's cool. Um, so that's your car. And are you when when do you get it? The Jaguar. I will be getting that. Um, my main focus right now is cash, uh, and I want to finance it through my life insurance. So I'll be putting a bunch of cash. I need forty-two thousand in my life insurance to finance it. Um, yeah. So that's my main goal: is just like get my cash up in the business, and then I'll get that. Because I um, I also have to buy it twice. It's fourteen hundred fifty bucks a month, including six hundred bucks a month paid to my insurance sure. loan. Um, so. I, if I buy it twice, that means I have to have an extra fourteen fifty that I'm putting towards other things, other investments, mm-hmm. um, which you know could be more insurance or whatever it is. And sure, figure that out. I, I, I'm more into investing in cars and art because I understand them. Um, and I also think it's kind of cool that you know I can put like twenty million dollars into a piece of art, um, like it holds value. It goes up by twelve percent every year. The art market does. It's just, it's not connected to anything. Right. So it's, it's completely arbitrary. It's just made up. Um, so it's really interesting. But um, did I tell you about that art deal? I kind uh, of have working in the okay. yeah. Go for it. Um, I don't. I don't want, yeah, I don't want to like completely um, take over the podcast. But, yeah, um, the, the, this John. This is why I yeah. wanted to have you on because I think that more people. I, I have a lot of random people on this show, to, just from different mm-hmm. backgrounds, and the conversations are wildly different. Um, I don't have what I would consider a lot of dreamers that believe their dreams are just like a methodical step away from them. Does that make sense? Okay, well, so like, I'll give you a, a, what, I, what I love about what you're sharing and the way you're sharing is like, yeah, it's not like if it's going to happen, here's my plan. And it's stuff that most people dream of and they think I, that could never be me, but you can mm-hmm. go from driving your Hyundai Sonata or whatever it is. And in a few years, have whatever thing you want and it's just a methodical like can you change your mind to believe it's possible and so many people struggle with that's literally it that's literally it and so that's why i like i want you just to share about like what's going on in john's life how is it unfolding what are the processes because this is where people they don't they don't know how to think like you they don't know how they've never been taught i had somebody on my podcast two years ago she studies uh, or her study in college was anthropo- linguistic anthropology. Oh, you told me about this before. I remember this because okay. nobody's ever said that word to me except for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just like when you study linguistic anthropology, there's people who don't know the words of success. They don't have the vocabulary. They don't know what interest is. We're talking about 12% interest. It grows every, they have no idea what that even means. Yeah. You see that? And they're like, why are you interested in me? They, they don't understand. Huh language they, they don't have the vocabulary yeah. of success and so it's important that people not only hear the vocabulary but they hear how to structure the vocabulary in a way that actually creates what they want uh, how to structure a sentence to be a creative sentence versus the demolishing sentence and so that's why I, I, i'm really cool just letting you chat about your yeah. life, what you're doing because i think it's important for people sure. to experience what that thought process feels like looks like sounds like Got it. Um, so I'm going to go through a few things and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing is 
I don't think money, uh, I, we always um, talk about success in the, in the only context that we talk about success is money. And it's the only thing that we all like universally grade each other on, but it's not the only measuring stick. Like right now, a lot of people might want my mental freedom, but they don't want my financial situation. And if I was only using money as a measuring stick, then they wouldn't get any help from me. They couldn't because they would look at my bank account and say, John, I don't want to have your financial situation. You know, you're not a millionaire yet. You know, you got debt. Yeah, I got debt, you know, right now. I got all kinds of stuff going on. Um, and I'm taking risks when most people wouldn't. And um, that's because well, like my three highest values, none of them are money, uh, are power. So power, learning, spirituality. I like to learn about like, this is like the thing that um, got Travis. Travis like, dude, I, I just want you to talk about war generals. So if you could do like a thing on that. I'm like, okay, I haven't even focused on that in a while, but you know, fine, I'll figure out how to like turn something about war into something useful for six and seven year business owners. I'll, I'll figure out a way. Um, Cause like, he, I see how excited he is about it. So I'm like, as long as I, if Travis is the only one that enjoys this, I'm good. No, you'll have a, you'll have a lot care. of people excited about it. Cause in that crowd, you get a lot of people who are uh, obsessed with, but they are, they study history. Like a lot of the people, they yeah. study history to know, like, how do we win like these people? Like how, how did they manage such big army and, mm -hmm. or manage so many people and get them to act in coordination to get where they need to go with generally respect, sometimes fear, mm -hmm. but generally like there's a, a directional asset to what they do. And so the, yeah, there's a lot of studying there. Like how do you build that? How do you build a culture that demands excellence that doesn't allow for, um, that's kind of interesting. Like the, it doesn't allow for failure because everybody's equally invested in the success of each other. So everybody holds each other to a high standard. So it's not just the one leader who's coming down on everybody, but everybody equally is holding each other to a high standard of becoming. So anyways, we, I, I would say we all study history and, yeah. and, uh, I'm taking notes by the way. I'm not, yeah, no, I, I understand that. history and war leaders. Um, because I feel, I feel like most of the people that are going to be at that, uh, at that mastermind, they're all at war with something. You know, the, the book with, by Patrick Bet David, his most recent book said, choose your enemies wisely, right? You have to choose what, what are you going to war for? What are you going to war against? Like, what is the thing that you're deconstructing systematically and dismantling so that you, the belief or, or identity that you believe should be on top prevails. And just like this type of this level of, uh, freedom that you've experienced mentally and that you're able to help people with you dismantle just in what you just said in the last five minutes, you're saying, look, if you're going to judge me off of this, 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 this standard, like financial sex success or all these different things, mm -hmm. you're dismantling their argument to not want to pursue with you. And if, if, yeah. and if they care about those things, then you are actively saying you're not for me. Right? So that what you did was you deconstructed the identity that might be against you and say, look, if this is how you're gauging success, either I'm inviting you to change because I think there's other ways to gauge success, or you probably won't want to work with me, which is NLP by, t by you're basically telling them, hey, don't try and work with me. You're saying you probably won't want to. You're not saying don't work with me. I mean, I mean there's, there's two camps of people um, sure. in the way, because like, I help people who are further behind in, in, than me in multiple ways as their coach. But like, if I have somebody, because like my purpose, my vision is to help people become more uh, powerful for good, because a lot of like it's the whole like they have guilt in their mind of bad shit that they did, and they keep doing the bad shit. That's where you get like billionaires and all that doing things that aren't ethical. Like you can make money ethically. Actually, I've made more money when I was more in ethics than whenever I wasn't. Like I money flows so easily now because like I, I manage my ethics so like so precisely. Um, to know like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, I will totally throw one person on the train tracks to save, you know, 50 others. 
mm-hmm. and it's because it's everything is on a gradient in ethics. It's not like here's ethical, here's not. It's like how ethical is it? And um, the uh, the thing is, is like if somebody is like you know seven eight figures, the two things that they should pay me for is to clear out their mental shit and to act as like hand of a king. If you've ever seen Game of Thrones. I've watched it, but I don't know that much. I didn't watch it that so, hand, hand of the King is basically like um, second in command. Now I'm not asking, like, wait me second in command in your life. No, but like, that's what you pay me for is like, you want the perspective that is likely going to challenge your own. Uh, because if you're only getting the same, like the, one of the stupidest, can I say the F word on here? Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, go for it. Um, one of the stupidest fucking things I've ever seen anybody say in my life is I want to be around like minded people. That's useless. You're saying I want to be surrounded by people who hold me accountable the way that I hold myself accountable, which the way I currently hold myself accountable isn't leading to things that I want. I want to be around people who think like me. Well, the way that you're thinking is currently leading to your results. Why would you want to be around like minded people? I want to be around people who think completely different than me who challenge me um, in like either making how I explain what I do better or changing how I explain what I do as an example, like changing the way that I I see the world because um, that's why I only study. I don't like do how to, if I need like a how to thing, I'll go get it. But I'm not like, there's all these like coaches and course creators and all that. And I'm like, there's only a few things that I would ever need to pay for. I pay for masterminds. I study billionaires and I study war generals. Those are the only two people who I want to be like because my my first uh, value is power. So I only do things that are similar to those who are most powerful. And I, I change my beliefs. I literally have a list of beliefs of billionaires and war generals that I have that, like, that's my beliefs that I'm moving towards. And once I have them, then I'll go find more that I need. And it's, it's like, I'm not going to skip with like, I don't want seven figure beliefs. I don't want six figure beliefs. I don't want to like have, you know, the beliefs of David Goggins. David Goggins is really good, but the thing he's like really good at fitness and doing hard shit, but it doesn't mean that like a lot of the, here, here's another thing, like a types who are always like full of energy and like, oh my God, just like charge forward raw, like, you know, like Andy Elliott, Grant Cardone folks like who are just like they just have them on in their ear like all day like those are the people who are grinding and all grinding does do you know what grinding produces exhaustion i don't know (laughs) for me dust yeah dust okay that's all that's produced now it makes a sharper edge but whenever you're swinging the sword with the flat side forward instead of the sharp side forward it doesn't rightly matter and i'm not saying you know what those guys share isn't helpful it's all helpful Sure. But it's the energy behind it because the here, here's where we talk about like energy tone levels. Those guys are at like a frustration and most guys are out of fear. So if they can pull the guys out of fear into frustration, and, and, I mean, uh, antagonism and get them to move, then they start taking action. That's why they're like, massive action, massive action. You got to move. Like, what are you doing? And they're like shaming guys. They get them out of shame into anger. Because anger is higher on the tone scale, and it means when you're angry, you take action. So that's why shame works so well for men. Whenever you shame women, they feel worse and worse and worse and get just depressed. And it's more of shaming the masculine and the feminine. It's not shaming men and women. It's like masculine men love being shamed because they like their problems being shoved in their face. They love it. I love it. Like, I love that. But the other side of it is you have all these guys who are just working and putting in effort, more effort doesn't equal more outcomes. Intention equals outcomes. And all these guys, I'm talking, okay, perfect example. Talking to a guy, he's been doing 30 grand a month for like two and a half years. And I'm like, it sounds like you're at a plateau. And he's like, yeah. But he's, he's like MMA, he's never done any spiritual stuff in his life. And he just has like a few marbles in his head. Marble, I'm not saying he's dumb, he's a very smart guy. But he just doesn't have... He doesn't have as many tools as he could have. He has the few tools that he has, and that's it. He's not seeking it. Right. It's like whenever you meet people who are are successful but simple-minded, like they they have a cap on their income because you can only build as high as you can build the foundation deep. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why he's stuck at 30 grand a month is because he hasn't started doing the mental work to actually dig out more space to build a deeper foundation for higher levels of success. And he, he's like a closer and he works all day. He works like 10 hours a day, six days a week, and he's making 30 grand a month. And like, he's in great shape. He's healthy. He's got Rolexes and, and physical objects of wealth. And he's got about half a million dollars in, in net worth. But for what? Like you're, you're like, especially as a salesperson, you have to keep selling to make money. He has nothing that's yeah. making money for him. Like there's no efficiency being added in. God, you should, in introduce, that. You should introduce that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we should. Um, he, he, uh, he needs some life insurance. That's yeah. for sure. He, he needs a lot of um, wealth insurance. building tools. Yeah. Wealth yeah. building tools. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. Bro, I bet he would be sick of selling insurance. Like, if you could talk about yeah. that, you know, wow. Let's, let's hook, up. <laughs> hook up the conversation. Yeah. Simple three way text. But um, that's like the challenge is that. Um, is that it's all of this like energy and and what we're led to believe. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you the story. Uh, I'm gonna to juxtapose this. I don't even know if I'm using that word right. Um, but we're all led to believe that putting in more effort and energy will lead to more outcomes. That even like wealthy people say that, but even they know that's not the thing that happened. Because but there are people put in who, more effort and energy into more intentional, specific outcome things. And then they just say, yeah, they have more intention. everybody, I had this conversation the other, uh, for, I don't know if it was a conversation just with my wife or not, but they put in more effort and energy into more intentional things. But because the intentional things are different for everybody based on what desired outcome you're trying to mm -hmm. chase, then it's hard for them to say, well, this is what I did specifically like, to, and, and outline it. Because if somebody does what they do, then they'll end up chasing Sam's dream, like if somebody does what Sam does, then they're yeah. going to end up chasing my dream rather than their dream. So it's actually almost mm -hmm. uh, harmful to say this is exactly what I did because then it impedes that. That's why I stopped ability. taking advice from people. Yeah, it impedes their ability to actually reach their their goals. It's just like, well, now you're going to be a mini me of Sam, and that's not what you want. I know that's not the purpose of this world. So why would I hurt you by telling you what I do specifically? Go find your own things that you're going to do specifically, and do those with a lot of energy and intention and passion, and then then that will get you to where you want to go. But if I tell you what I did, you're going to get to where I want to go. And although you might think that you want to be where I am because you see the accolades, the money, the whatever, then you're going to, you might get here and be absolutely miserable because you climbed somebody else's mountain. And that's just the worst feeling ever is climbing somebody else's mountain yeah. and realizing you're on yeah. the wrong fucking mountain. And that sucks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, I have a whole thing. I wish I could share it um, at the event, but I only have 30 minutes because I have this whole thing explaining why Elon Musk moves so fast. Like I have a whole explanation of like how he does that. Um, but, um, I'm going to tell the story I was going to tell, uh, to, uh, as the counter to that. Um, because like, I'm like, this is what, six months ago, I'm sitting on the sales team and I'm starting this e-com store. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, I got to make some kind of form of money. I, you know, I see all the, all the students cause I was selling an e-com business opportunity offer. Mm -hmm. I was like, why can't I do it? Why don't I try it? And I'm doing this and I'm checking it out and I'm not really enjoying anything about the process like at all. And I'm moving really quickly. Like I'm getting everything done. I get like uh, two weeks worth of stuff done in a weekend. And, and I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, this isn't, I, I, don't, I don't even care if I'd make a lot of money doing this. So I was like, what do I do next? And then I came up with this idea. I'm going to make fine art vision boards. So I take people's vision, help them get really clear on what the mountain is that they want to climb, basically. And then get 10 out of 10 clear on it. Not 8 out of 10, not 7 out of 10. You get 10 out of 10 clear on it. Because if, if you, if you had perfect vision, like, let me ask you, Sam, if you were driving a car and you had seven out of 10 vision, would you drive very fast? Probably not. Well, I don't know. I'm pretty dumb, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if you were I understand. 10 out of 10. Yeah. 10 out of 10. If you, were, if you were 10 out of 10 on your vision, how fast would you drive? Fast as I could safely. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why people procrastinate and hold themselves back. It's not because of anything other than a lack of clarity. Because if they could see the path, and it, it's like the whole, um, what's his name? 
the guy who runs RSD, uh, Real Social Dynamics. Um, something Owen, Owen Cook, that it, there it is. Um, so Owen Cook, he's like brain plus thing. Now I don't believe that we're run by our brains. I believe we, our brains are in our bodies, but we have a brain, we have a body. We are a spiritual being driving around the body and the brain is just how we interface with the body and tell it to do things. Uh, but he's like brain plus lane. And what that means is uh, when you see a, a clear path to get to your goal, you speed up. That's all it means. And that's what's happening to Dylan. He's inside. He was trying to sell the wrong offer and he just went back to an offer that was working previously. And he's been working like eight, 10, 12 hour days, just nonstop doing videos, making sales. He's already got a hundred people in. Like he, he's just like got an insane amount of momentum. And this is in the last three days. And um, let's rewind. This is before I was um, outside of the sales position. I'm about to leave and I'm like, let's do these fine art vision boards for people, get people really clear on their goals so they can move fast. You know, brain plus lane, all that jazz. Um, and what was really interesting is I have a lot of mentors and and friends and my friends and my mentor, my mentor who does $60 million a year in e-commerce, he got there just by doing vision boards. Like, he, that's like he's done a vision board for every single one of his goals of everything in truth. So I'm like, okay, cool. Everybody who says they did one and actually meant to do it and had the intention to do the things, they say these exact words. Everything on my vision board, 100% of everything on my vision board came true. And I'm like, holy shit. So now what if it was a piece of fine art that was really badass that depicted your whole life? You know, now that's, that's a bigger thing. It takes a lot more time. That's like a three year project where I work with a client. We have to do a bunch of mental work together. But like, what if you could have 10 out of 10 clarity in your vision board instead of it being like just these cut out pictures? Cause that's not what life looks like. Right. You know, like, well, what if you had 10 out of 10 clarity on everything? Um, so I'm like, I'm going to do that. And then my other friend, mentor, whatever you want to call him, um, he does multiple eight figures in e-com. He used to work with Alex Becker. And he's like, I think you should listen to this podcast about Larry Gagosi. Now, Larry Gagosi is a billionaire art dealer. And I didn't know I could do that. You know, most of us don't have reality on what our options are, of what we can do or what we, like the lanes we can create. Like there's no such thing as a fine art vision board artist. I have one friend, one person in the world does it and he's my mentor on it. And he's basically handing the baton to me to do it. So I will, I'm the only person and um, I'm glad I am because it's like all I want to do. It's like, I, that's really fucking cool. And it's going to be fun. But um, he's like, Check out this podcast. I listen to the guy. I'm like, holy crap. This dude can call up somebody and make like a million dollar commission from an art sale in like 10 minutes. Like he, he told a story in there. Of like um, he, he called up one of his friends and he was like, hey, I got this painting. It's currently at 7 million. Do you want to buy it? And he's like, no, but what do you do like six? And then he calls somebody else. And he sells it for eight. And then he calls up the other guy. And he's like, I just sold it for 10. I'll sell it to you for 16 right now. And he sold the painting to the guy who said no at seven. He sold it to him for like 12, 13, 14 million dollars on that call. And he made a commission of 10 to 20% per sale. So he just made like a couple million bucks over the span of about an hour. Selling the same and, three different people? Yes, like every, every transaction he gets paid. So, um, and I'm like, holy crap, I wanna do that. So I, I just like set an intention. I was like so unbelievably certain I'm going to create this. Three months later, I get a message from a friend. She's like a hundred million dollars net worth. She Shark Tank lady. Um, uh, well, she was invited on. She's she's like the sweetest person I know. She's like so amazing, and she's like, and I I'm not an art broker, so I have not told anybody I'm an art broker. And she reaches out to me and she's like, Hey, I got this nine hundred fifty thousand dollar art deal uh, that. Do you know anybody who would want to uh, buy it? And I'm like, holy shit. I just manifested this. Because like there was nothing, no other strings I put out. I just set an intention and it came to me. And I'm still in the middle of the art deal. Um, turns out it's, uh, by the way, if you know anybody who needs a piece of art, <laughs> it's a uh, Jackson Pollock, very famous artist. Uh, one of uh, the most recent uh, auctions for a Pollock. 
sold it sold for 130 million and um this one's not fully authenticated so if they want to gamble a million dollars to see if it's worth somewhere between 20 and you know 100 million that's where it's going to land um my intention is to uh you know sell it for the million let's get it authenticated pour in maybe 50 100 grand more to get it authenticated and then uh, once we know it is then it will immediately be somewhere between 20 and 100 million and i'm just going to call up the guy who bought the 130 million dollar painting and sell it to him um and it's like the, the the fundamental belief that i changed in myself is that i used to believe that i couldn't just take bigger baby steps and i couldn't have it now and that's a belief that's sold to us because like we do need to take baby steps you know the, the idea isn't to go like this forever you just go straight up and, and to the right like j curve for life no it's just that maybe you have a j curve now that lands you to taking much larger baby steps because most baby steps are like this big Right? right, and there are these little tiny steps. Why can't we just go like this from the get-go and just increase the size of the step so we don't have to increase the speed at which we're moving, we just increase the am amount of space which we move through with each step. And whenever we do that, that's like the work that I do with people. It's like, how do we like, it's not faster. It's how, how do we ex like, Increase it by an order of magnitude through strategy. Because my thing is strategy. Like, if you've ever played video games, all I did as a kid was I played strategy games. I, I played war games, but I didn't play Call of Duty because I was really bad at it. And I, I was like 11 and I'd get yelled at. So I'm like, I'm just going to pick that. I don't like that anymore. So I just play like Age of Empires and um, uh, what is it? Uh, Total War, things like that. Oh, I, I just care about playing a really, really big game. That's all I, that's the only thing that excites me. That's why like power is one of my values. It's like, it's the only thing that excites me. It's like, how do I bite off more than I can chew? And then I get a stronger jaw instead of cutting it into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause most people try and cut it into smaller pieces and that's because their beingness, their soul, their, their spirit can't handle it. They're like, this is too much. This is too far, too fast. I got to give up this opportunity. You know, it's kind of like the speaking gig. Like I've never spoken in front of uh, six and seven figure people. I have a negative net worth right now. And yet for some reason, people think it might be interesting to listen to me talk. So I could do one of two things. I can let that intimidate me out of doing the thing or just decide, like, let me go give a speech and totally fuck it up. Who cares? I'm probably not, but what if it bombs, you know, like, and and that's the thing is like how do we just increase our baby steps and if we do that and the way you do that is you expand your beingness to take responsibility for more things in the physical universe um i'd have to draw that out to explain so if it's yeah we don't have time for that one but we are yeah. <laughs> we're running out of time <laughs> <laughs> i know i've been watching you i i hope that people are thinking like what there's going to be half the people who listen to this that are going to be like, I don't know what John's talking about. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah. okay. The reality is you may not understand what he's talking about. The The goal of us putting it out there is to under, like, is to be exposed to it. Um, I did hear, or I th through a series of conversations over the last few days, it's been fascinating. Um, one, one individual I met with, they, uh, there's this, concept of being enlightened, right? So once you experience further light and truth in life, then the question is, what is your obligation, moral or internal obligation to share that with, with other people, right? If you, if you see people who aren't enlightened, then, and you are enlightened, oftentimes you have like this internal desire to just help people get enlightened. When you find, when you go to a really good restaurant and it tastes really good and it's the best restaurant you've ever been to, the natural thing is to like want to share it with people. When you try something amazing, you want to share it with other people. Well, same thing when your mind gets expanded, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was all of this. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, did you guys know about this? And you start, you almost start not second guessing. You're absolutely certain about your circumstances, but you start did to- Did you guys know this? Did you know? Did you know? <laughs> like, checking for verification because you're like, is this really how it works? Am I, am I insane? Am I going crazy? But no, I know I'm not going crazy because this works for me and it happens every time. And so I know it's not me, but- why, why, if, if this is really how it works, why doesn't everybody know about this? This is incredible. Well, then the question is, <laughs> do you choose to share that with somebody else? 
And when you read a lot of scriptural texts, many enlightened individuals in through historical scriptural texts, actually they share to a point. And then mm-hmm. what's fascinating, and I think this is so fu- funny, like it doesn't matter what religion you're studying, they share to a point, and then rather than just not sharing anymore, or rather than oversharing, they all get to a point where they say, I feel spiritually constrained. I feel like I was instructed by whoever taught me, whatever, not to share more. Like they get to a point where they say, I don't feel that I am supposed to share anymore. I know more, but th- for whatever reason, they, ha- they feel the need in spiritual texts. I, I can tell you why. To, well, well I, I, yeah. I, I'm gonna let you share yeah, that maybe, part. Maybe, but, maybe you know why. Well, I, I believe I know why, so I'm gonna let you verify okay. why. But, but sure. what's fascinating, is why do they say like what what's the reason for being very pronounced sometimes whole chapters in these segments where they're they're revealing they're prophesying all this and then all of a sudden they come to a i'm not supposed to say anymore lips tie okay it's almost like they got slapped upside the head by the god saying hey stop it people need to discover you can't tell some people some things you have to allow them to discover it. So anyways, I'm curious why, why for you, why do you believe it's that, that you shouldn't share if just cause you've been enlightened doesn't mean it's your job to go and force enlightenment onto other people. I, I don't think you can force enlightenment no matter how hard you try. Um, there's a, a concept in spirituality called going too far too fast where you sh- like, I've almost done this. We're like, because I've gotten people so blown out that they've been able to like leave their body and and like hang out as a spirit instead of as a, as a body because you're not a body. And I remember doing this with a girl. She had never had like an experience like this, and she was like having a really bad time. And I showed her like how like where all of her bad time came from, and I just kept going, and I just kept like laying everything I could because I wanted to see how far I could take her. But like the thing is, if you pull someone up really high. But their chronic tone is down here then they're going to come down really really hard and because like yeah you can sit and teach people but like i've done four thousand hours of this and i'm nowhere near close i got three more years to go through everything to be at the point of actual enlightenment which is um i mean in, enlightenment is realizing you're god that's what that is like that's what that means and, and, and i want to i want to highlight that so real life yeah. god is some people uh say realizing as a mental cognition state but there's a difference between like in taxes just it's feeling it. money on paper well just because you have money on paper you have income <laughs> you have realized yeah. income. realized income is money that's actually claimed and taken money that's happened in the stock market is not realized so realized growth only is realized when you've turned your your fictitious money that grew in the stock market into cash and you went and spent it mm. So when you realize you're God, it's not the recognition that you could be a God or that you were designed to be a God. That's a step, mm-hmm. but you are only mm-hmm. realized as a God when you choose to bring that spiritual that's real to you. into reality. That's the realization yeah. of God, not, yeah. or that in, in, uh, in Christ sent, like in, in Christian worlds, they call it the condensation mm-hmm. of God. It's when we actually take Godhood and put it into practice, not just that we could be a God. Yeah. Everybody could be a God. Let's all accept that. Oh, yeah, I could be a God. When I die, I'll become a God. No, you won't. If you didn't practice it, you didn't realize it here, you're not going to be anything other than who you are today later. Good for you. Anyways. That way. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so, we're going to go down a whole ass rabbit hole that we don't have time for. So. No, we, we don't have um, time for it. <laughs> yeah. We can have another conversation. I freaking love this stuff. After uh, trying yeah. to have a call with you, he, he called me. He's like, dude. I know why you and John get along so well. <laughs> I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what, what, what it is that you guys like about me so much. I'm so like, I was grilling him yesterday, trying to get him to like disqualify me for the event. Like, and I was just like, I don't know. I'm just I, I, trying to see, I can't see your perspective, which is interesting. Cause it's, um, I can't see myself how other people see me. And it's one of the most interesting things whenever you hear people talk about you. Um, especially when you're like, I, no, don't get me wrong. Um, one of the things I'm working on right now is being um, arrogant. 
So like, I also have, like, I have to smack that down and get rid of that. But, um, yeah, it's been, I appreciate you guys hanging out with me and uh, wanting me to come. Cause I think, I think it's going to be fun either way. Um, and if it's not, who cares? You know, whatever. Yeah. You'll love it. The, just the way that you create and think about the world, you're going to be in good company in that. <laughs> It's, it's interesting, like being around people that are like you doesn't always mean people that think like you. It's around people who are just as equally eccentric out there and have their own random belief system. Like when I'm looking for people like me, I'm, I'm ultimately looking for people that are nothing like me. Like if you're too much like me, then you're yeah. not at all because- Like cra- crazy as shit. Like most people don't get me when I'm like talking loud at a diner, everybody looks at me weird. Yeah, like, like the people like yeah. me are people that I'm still trying to figure out because I'm still trying to figure out me. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe yeah. anything I say past it coming out of my mouth most of the time. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I actually told my wife this when we were dating because she's like, well, I, I did door to door sales. And so it was like, I made a profession out of like being certain and sounding certain in my tones, like yes. I money sounding like I know what I know what I'm talking about, right? That's how I make money. Why would I ever give up that skill? It's a freaking awesome skill which means everything I say, and some of my family members don't like it, that when I say things, I sound certain as if I like know it. I'm like, yeah. I'm actually questioning everything I say almost all the time because I want to grow. Yeah. <laughs> like yes. I believe what I just said, I don't know, <laughs> but like, let's float it out there and see if anybody else believes it. And so when I told my wife, yeah. when I was dating her, I was like, look, I'm looking for somebody like to marry that will push back because I know that what I know that when I speak, I sound certain. I also know that 90% of like what's going on inside my head, 90% of what I'm saying, I don't actually know if I believe it. I'm constantly questioning my head. <laughs> but if you roll over and just accept what I, ever, I say as truth because it sounded true, <laughs> then I don't get to grow. Yeah. I want to grow. And so I can't be married mm. to somebody who's not going to push back on my belief system because. I want to grow. And if I'm coupling myself with somebody who is too uncertain about life to accept mm-hmm. the certain tone, it won't, I, I won't get to grow and I will feel unfulfilled. That won't be good for me. And so anyways, that was one of the first few conversations I had with my wife is like, I need you to push back because I know that what I'm saying, I don't always believe where I want to, even if I do believe it, I want it to be challenged. I want to know why I believe it. Yeah, that's really good. But I, that's my takeaway from this because I, I run, I, I don't have a wife, but I run my relationships uh, much different than that. Um, but the last one that I had, like, she's really good at business. Like she's my best friend and like, she's like my ace in the back pocket. She has so many skills now, but it's like, um, I didn't want that in the beginning, but I can totally see how that's useful. It's like somebody being able to push back, um, especially if they know what they're talking about. Um, well, I think, I think another thing that makes that work in our relationship, because I've seen this in other people's relationships, and, and this might, while you work on being arrogant or whatever that looks like for you, I don't yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think what happens, the degradation of a lot of relationships is the need to be right. And I'm mm. actually committed to not being right. Like, I don't care about being right. Uh, I ne- even in arguments, or if you want to call that, conversations with my wife, neither of us are seeking to be right or be justified in our feelings. Neither of us are. All we care about is kind of like what you said, like the vision board. Hey, what are we trying to create? Yeah. Does, does this help us? Like, I don't care about who's right. I care about what's going to help us get to where we want to go. I, 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 I'll yeah. be wrong. You can slander me. You can say everything. Fine. I'll accept all of it. So where do we go from here? Like, that's all that matters. Like, what's the next step? Because what, where we're at, we're here already. So where do we go? Yeah. What's the next step? Because it doesn't matter about really it, right? If you think you're right, let's try it out. Let's do, let's do your plan for a month and see how we feel in a month. And then if, if we decide we like my plan better, then we'll go back to my plan until we find something else better. Like the, I don't care about being right as far as like, did we decide on something? Are we acting on it to determine whether we like it and it's getting closer to our goals or not? And if it isn't, then let's ditch it. Let's just ditch that belief and go on to a new belief. But it's all about chasing, as you say, like, the realization of becoming God, like how do we become for me? You, I, you say power. I don't know what you mean by power. I'm really curious for me. It's creation. Like mm. for, for me, my highest value is creation. Like, are you intentionally creating 
or are you passively being a victim of your surroundings? Like that is my highest, highest value, which is why I vow never to be the same person in two years from now or in a year from now or in a month from now. Like if I'm the same person in a year from now that you met two years ago or, or two, two months ago, then I failed. Like I, <laughs> I haven't changed at all. What the heck? My whole goal and focus is change. How, and if I haven't changed at all, then that sucks for me. That's decent. So I like that. Uh, it's well, well thought. Most people aren't well, like, one of the challenges I have is a lot of people regurgitate things that they have had, you know, like they're consumed in books or videos or from their favorite, you know, guy down the street or YouTube or whatever. Um, and it makes it really difficult because it, it sounds like they don't believe what they're saying. It sounds like they're saying it because they hope one day they'll believe it. But I believe, I feel that you believe what you're saying right now. And that's why I said like decent, because like I, I don't get to hear that very often when people actually believe what they say. And like it's actually something they, they feel, something in their being rather than, you know, just like, that's why I'm not like a big fan of like feel things in your body. The thing that matters is your being, because your being is driving the body. Mm -hmm. And I can feel that from you. So like, I just want to commend you because like, I, I don't get to feel that from people very often. It feels good. So okay. well, that's awesome. I'm glad. Hey, we, we have to cut this off, but we'll see each other on Friday. We do. Uh, up yeah. Downtown, and I'm excited about that. And yeah, thank you so much, John, for coming on. We can have more of these. Um, you have the link. You can yeah. see what you want to chat and record <laughs> a, a brain dump <laughs> section of like where we're at. Yeah. I'm all for it, honestly. Totally. We need more people dreaming. We need more people, conscious creators who are focusing on becoming and, and being. Yeah. Um, I'm all into it. So thank you so much for your time. This is fun. Appreciate it. Hey, um, it, just really quick. If somebody did want to reach out to you uh, and get involve themselves more in your world and your thought process, mm -hmm. hire you to coach them, where would they go to reach you? Uh, Facebook. So John Schutte, J-O-H-N-S-C-H-U-E-T-T-E -T -T -E on Facebook. And I actually created a tool. I created two tools yesterday. Yesterday was productive. Uh, one of them was called the Risk Mitigator. So if you're thinking of doing something risky in your life, I'm going to give this tool to you for free. It's a whole tool that helps you basically. Um, the thing that makes war generals successful in war is that they can consider all of the dynamics that are involved. And this is basically a tool that does that. It allows you to see everything you're not currently seeing and a risk that you might be wanting to take. It allows you, it has a chat GPT prompt at the end to actually build a curriculum for uh, all the things you need to learn that you get from going through the process. So um, I don't have a fancy way of explaining it. I literally just made it. But if anybody wants that, you can reach out to me on Facebook. Just like, I don't know, DM me risk mitigator. And uh, if you know how to spell the word mitigator, I had to figure it out too. Um, <laughs> 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 but, uh, you can re re reach out to me there. Um, I got that and other free, free resources. So you guys can... Um, you guys can just reach out and I'll, uh, I'll just send you whatever I got, but I give away for free and you can check it out. Awesome. Uh, Love it. Hey, we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy Show. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.